Jamie, I look forward to your talk and thank you for, for doing this. And of course, also thank you to the Arthritis Foundation for, for orchestrating this. Uh, we have all been looking forward to this. Hello, thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. Um, can everybody see my slides? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so thanks very much. I'm Jamie Collins and I'm a biostatistician at Bregman Women's Hospital in Boston. Um, as I said, I'm a biostatistician, so I'm gonna speak about soluble and imaging biomarkers in OA from that perspective. Um, so just to start, what is a biomarker? And according to the National Institutes of Health Biomarkers Definition Working Group, um, a biomarker is a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes, or pharmacologic responses to a therapeutic intervention. Um, it can diagnose illness, uh, predict illness, or assess a patient's physical condition. Um, in the early 2000s, there was an effort from the OA research community to begin to characterize and classify OA biomarkers. So this paper was published in 2006 with a proposed classification for OA biomarkers, the biped classification. Um, so this characterizes um, OA biomarkers as burden of disease. So um, biomarkers that assess the severity or extent of disease. So for example, KL grade. Investigative, so biomarkers where there's insufficient information to allow inclusion into one of the existing categories. Prognostic, the ability to predict the future onset of OA among those without OA or the progression of OA among those with existing disease. Efficacy of intervention provides information about the efficacy of treatment among those with OA or those at high risk of developing OA. Or diagnostic, so the ability to classify individuals either as diseased or non-diseased, so for example, KL less than two or KL two or higher. So this effort led to the FNIH OA Biomarkers Consortium, which is a public-private partnership managed by the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health and co-sponsored by ORSI. So I'll spend the bulk of the talk today talking about um, the Biomarkers Consortium. This project was led by David Hunter and Virginia Cross, and the rationale is summarized in this uh, 2014 paper that I put in the footnote. It was also presented at the 2015 ORSI pre-Congress workshop, and those slides are available at the link below. Um, so the goal of the first phase, phase of the project was to determine whether any of a number of soluble and imaging biomarkers are associated with OA progression. Um, again, here's the sort of rationale paper. Um, so this was a nested case control study within the osteoarthritis initiative to determine the predictive and concurrent validity of structural and biochemical biomarkers for radiographic and pain progression in knees with mild to moderate tibial femoral OA. Um, the outcome was case status, which was a composite radiographic and pain progression, um, where the radiographic progression was loss of medial minimum joint space width of at least seven tenths of a millimeter from baseline to either 24, 36, or 48 months. Um, and pain progression was an increase versus baseline of at least nine points in Womack pain maintained at more than two or two or more time points. And this um, is the MCID and Womack pain on the zero to 100 scale. Biomarkers were assessed at baseline 12 and 24 months, and um, all of the data are publicly available um, on the OAI website. So for the FNIH OA Biomarkers Consortium, again, these knees were selected from the larger OAI study. Um, eligible knees were KL1 to 3 at baseline. They had joint space width and pain data available. They had MRI, serum, and urine available at baseline in 24 months. Exclusions included knees that were unable to progress, so knees with less than one millimeter of joint space width at baseline or with pain greater than 91 out of 100. Um, knees that met the primary case definition at 12 months or subjects that underwent knee replacement or hip replacement at 12 or 24 months were excluded. And controls were frequency matched to cases on BMI and KL grade. Um, so these are the imaging biomarkers that were included. Um, it included um, radiography-based bone trabecular integrity measured by fractal signature analysis, and then quantitative and semi-quantitative measures of cartilage, bone, and meniscal morphometry. And so these are all listed here. And then the biochemical markers included 12 biomarkers, um, 18 total by format, as some were measured in both serum and urine. 
that were chosen by consensus of an expert working group, um, which is that 2011 paper in the footnote. And again, we don't have time to sort of review the rationale for these in detail, but um, the, it's provided in these um, references below. So the big picture, what we did as part of this project was assess the association between baseline biomarkers and OA progression, so sort of a prognostic biomarker, and then assess the association between early change in biomarkers, so changes over 12 to 24 months, um, and later progression, so the 48-month progression, and this was thinking more about um, a surrogate endpoint. So the case definition um, is a bit complex here. Again, this the primary case definition was the composite joint space width and pain progression, um, where controls included participants that had JSW progression only, so no pain progression, subjects that had pain progression, but no joint space width progression, and subjects that had no progression. And so this composite of joint space width plus pain was a thought to represent clinically meaningful progression. And actually, as we heard earlier this afternoon in that um, demo talk, we can't get approval for a disease modifying drug unless there's some patient benefit. So, you know, it was thought that sort of combining the structural and symptom um, progression would sort of give us our best shot at identifying those patients who are likely to progress on both. Um, not without controversy, though, because as we're, you know, sort of comparing these composite cases back to our controls, there are subjects that, that did have some progression in the control group. Um, so for the statistical analysis, we use logistic regression to quantify the association between each biomarker um, and case status. Multivariable models included biomarkers with a p-value less than 0.10 and bivariate analysis. And um, different selection procedures were utilized to select markers and determine the most parsimonious model. So we use the AIC, the BIC, and the p-value. Um, the AIC tends to favor sort of more complex models that risk overfitting, where the BIC tends to favor um, less complex, sort of more parsimonious models, but there's a chance of underfitting. And so we use you know, different ways to try to figure out kind of the best um, subset of markers and then compared the markers selected across the different approaches. And we did tenfold cross-validation to try to estimate the out-of-sample performance, but we did not have an independent validation data set. Um, and we'll come back to this um, and discuss other ways as, that these data you know, can be assessed, have been assessed, may be assessed to talk a little bit about the pluses and minuses of this sort of more traditional statistical analysis versus more complex kind of big data methods. Um, so there were 194 composite joint space width and pain progressors and 406 controls. So among those controls, 103 had joint space width progression, 103 had pain progression, and 200 had no progression. The cases and controls were, were well balanced on most um, baseline characteristics. So the average age was around 62, about 60% 60 female, with an average BMI close to 31. About a third of subjects reported a history of knee injury. Um, baseline baseline Kellgren's Lawrence grade, Lawrence grade was one baseline characteristic that we were not able to well match between the groups. So 44% of the cases had a baseline Kell grade three compared to 33% of controls. Um, the baseline Womack pain was, was quite modest on average about 12 and um, the baseline joint space width was about 3.9 millimeters. So we did this work in stages, first investigating the association within each domain of a biomarker, so for semi-quantitative biomarkers, for biochemical biomarkers, et cetera. And so I've just included the references here because I won't walk through all of this in detail. But we have a final paper that's under review um, that's sought to sort of evaluate all of the markers together. So that's what I'm going to focus on in terms of presenting the results. Um, so these are the results of the baseline value of the biomarker to predict that composite joint space width and pain progression. And again, we use these three different selection procedures to try to find the most parsimonious model. Um, so the adjusted cross-validated AUCs were between 0.64 and 0.67. Um, in terms of interpreting that, so a value of 0.5 would mean that um, the model sort of no better than chance alone. A value of one would indicate perfect discrimination. So these values are they're they're pretty modest. Um, they're better than better than flipping a coin. Um, but that a value of 0.64 to 0.67 is is a sort of modest AUC. Um, 
The number of locations affected by osteophyte at baseline um, from the semi-quantitative assessment and the patella shape vector were um, selected in all three of the modeling approaches. And then semi-quantitative Hoffa synovitis, um, semi-quantitative cartilage thickness, quantitative cartilage thickness, and serum NTX1 were selected um, in some of the approaches. And then we looked at 24 months change in biomarker to present, uh, to predict composite joint space width and pain progression. I apologize, this slide is a little bit busy, but I'd like to just point out that the AUCs are a little bit higher here. So between 0.68 and 0.72. So having some information in how those markers changed over 24 months seems to improve our ability to discriminate between cases and controls. Um, a number of biomarkers were selected into the multivariable model across the three methods. So what sticks out here is a semi-quantitative effusion synovitis, um, whether there were any reg regions with worsening in meniscal morphology, um, the mean quantitative cartilage thickness in the central medial femur. And then um, NTX1 was selected. So sometimes the urine base and sometimes the serum base. I'm not sure sort of what that um, um, suggests, but that it seems like this marker um, was important. And then there were another of other biomarkers um, sort of selected in our um, kind of less stringent AIC and p-value based approaches. So markers of bone shape, semi-quantitative cartilage and osteophytes and bone area um, were, were selected and did seem to improve um, the discriminative ability of the model with this improved AUC. Um, so the study highlights a combination of biomarkers that could provide prognostic utility in the context of OA disease modifying trials and properly qualified. These biomarkers could be used to enrich future trials with participants likely to progress. Um, and so phase two of this study is ongoing, uh, the PROGRESS OA study. And the second phase of the project is again led by David Hunter and Virginia Krauss. And the goal is to qualify radiographic MRI and biochemical biomarkers with the FDA as prognostic biomarkers of NEOA with the idea is to establish a prognostic enrichment strategy to select patients with a high likelihood of progression into D-mode trials. So again, the, the project is ongoing and it's going to utilize data from existing clinical trials in NEOA. And so this can sort of serve as an independent validation set to see if those markers that seemed important in the um, initial FNIH study um, are predictive of progression in these clinical trials. So just wanted to briefly touch on some limitations of the current work and how some investigators have attempted you know, different approaches to look at these data. Um, so thinking about nonlinear associations, is the association between a biomarker and the risk of progression a dose response relationship or are there thresholds that we should be considering? Um, interactions, so does the association between a biomarker and progression depend on a third variable or a third biomarker? So for example, is there, you know, a marker that's important in women but not in men, or a marker that's, um, you know, important in obese patients but not non-obese patients, um, and that, that this traditional statistical modeling framework makes it difficult to assess sort of all possible interactions. And finally, feature selection. So how do we choose which variables um, we want to include in multivariable modeling? And I'll, I'll be honest and say that the, you know, the statistical literature does include some criticisms of the bivariate screening approach that we used in, um, in our analysis. And so thinking about are there other ways to identify um, which markers should be included in the model? And so all of these limitations can be addressed with more complex sort of machine learning based approaches. And, and the trade-off is usually in interpretation. Um, you know, I didn't have time to go through all of the results in detail, but we did quantify the association between each biomarker and the, the risk of being in that progression group using adjusted odds ratios. And so more complex models sometimes lose some of this interpretability, um, but can overcome some of the challenges that I've listed here. So I just wanted to quickly review one such study that used the data from the FNIH um, biomarkers cohort. Um, so this is work from Amanda Nelson and her group at UNC evaluating machine learning approach to NEOA phenotyping using data from the FNIH OA Biomarkers Consortium. And so what they did here was um, apply a clustering method, distance-weighted discrimination, in order to determine which biomarkers separated the progressors from the non-progressors. Um, and so for this analysis, they looked just at the composite joint space within pain progressors versus sort of the composite no progression. And so um, just in sort of comparing these results and the markers selected here to, to what I showed previously, it's not an exactly um, sort of apples to apples comparison. Um, 
But what's nice about this method is it does not require a first step of feature selection. So all potential predictors can be um, evaluated simultaneously. They didn't need to do that bivariate screen that we did in our logistic regression models. So all covariates, the MRI assessments, the demographic and clinical variables, the biochemical markers were evaluated using a single statistical test. Um, and this is what you end up with to, to determine the relative importance of each variable. So variables um, associated with progression are above this null line and variables associated with the non-progression group are below the line. So for example, um, urine CTX2, semi-quantitative BMLs, osteophytes, and medial meniscal extrusion were associated with um, a, a higher likelihood of being in that progression group. And finally, I just wanted to quickly touch on deep learning in terms of biomarkers from imaging data. Um, this is a little bit outside my area of expertise, but we're really seeing it more and more. Um, so in what we think of as machine learning or even um, just a traditional statistical model, we train algorithms to learn from data and make predictions. Um, and we have this sort of feature extraction step. So in the FNIH OA Biomarkers Consortium analyses, the biomarkers themselves had already been you know, assessed or coded in some way. So we had the data that say quantified um, the, the cartilage thickness in the central medial femur or that quantified um, P2AMP. So those, those features were sort of um, quantified and coded and then that was what we used in our classification. Um, in deep learning though, which is you know, really being increasingly used to assess imaging data, the feature extraction and classification are done simultaneously. So the algorithm is fed the image and then actually the pixels in the image provide the information to ultimately do the classification. Um, I think this is really exciting. It can save time and resources as the image does not have to be pre-processed. It doesn't have to be scored. Um, it can also uncover features of the image that we may have overlooked. So, you know, we've sort of scored what we score on the MRI because we think those are the features that are important, but are there things that, that we could be quantifying that we aren't? Um, so I think that's sort of an, an exciting piece of this, this methodology. And I just wanted to, to quickly show um, a recent paper that came out looking at deep learning to predict knee replacement. And so this group used a three-dimensional dense net convolutional neural network for prediction of total knee replacement using MRI data. Again, it used this automated feature extraction. So it didn't feed it any sort of coded or quantified MRI data, but just fed it the image. Um, and it incorporated the MRI of the knee joint in addition to clinical and demographic information. And, and something to highlight here is that they use data from all um, 4,796 OAI participants. So, you know, not just those that have had the MRI read. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the numbers are up to now, but I believe it's about a thousand of the OAI participants have actually had their MRIs assessed. So if you'd like to do you know, date, um, a, a sort of traditional statistical model looking at MRI data as a predictor, you're sort of stuck with the data that's been read. And here with just feeding the image into the algorithm, um, you can use all, all the images, all of the data. You don't have to rely on it being sort of scored first. Um, this is the occlusion map that it highlights the tissues that were most significantly um, affecting the TKR prediction. Um, so again, you can sort of see where the where these so-called hotspots are in terms of what seemed to be most important in predicting outcome. And um, this paper actually took things one step further. Um, and if I'm sort of understanding it correctly, what they're trying to do here is, is really quantify that map. Um, and so I believe this is assessing sort of for each patient whether kind of having a hotspot identified in that region is associated with the risk of TKR. Um, and so I'm just, you know, showing this to emphasize that there are ways to try to link this deep learning based prediction to specific tissues and specific biomarkers. And so I think these methods can be used as a way to improve prediction, but also perhaps in biomarker discovery with imaging data. So are there kind of, again, areas on that um, occlusion map that are, are kind of pinging as being important? And, and where are they? What are they measuring? And is it something that we should think about trying to quantify? So just in summary, um, the FNIH OA Biomarkers Consortium identified a number of potential prognostic imaging and biochemical markers to identify patients at risk of OA progression. Just like to, em to emphasize here that you know, different biomarkers identified um, at baseline versus that change over 24 months. So again, it's a question, are we looking at kind of a prognostic biomarker or a, a surrogate endpoint? Um, 
And different biomarkers were identified when we looked at predicting that composite case status, so that joint space width plus pain together, versus looking at secondary analyses where we looked at everybody who had, for example, um, worsening in joint space width. And again, the second phase of the project is ongoing. Um, there's more detail at the FNIH website. And again, that, that effort is being led by um, David Hunter and Virginia Krauss. Just in terms of future um, directions, some ideas that I'd like to investigate or are working on. Um, again, I think approaches that can investigate complex relationships between variables may shed additional light on potential biomarkers and complex interactions. So supervised machine learning to predict outcomes. So again, in that FNH study to predict the composite joint space width and pain progression. Um, clustering methods to uncover phenotypes. And so that's the theme of um, the K that I just got from NIAMS. I, I don't have results to show you or I would have shown you today, but um, just trying to see, you know, are there features that tend to cluster together and, and, and are those clusters then predictive of outcome? And finally, uh, different statistical methods such as generalized additive models, penalized methods, other combinatorial approaches that can look at sort of a composite biomarker and I'd just like to emphasize some guidance from the FDA about composite biomarkers. Um, so a composite biomarker consists of several individual biomarkers that are combined in a stated algorithm to reach a single interpretive readout. Um, and, and there's this understanding that one, signal, one single diagnostic test or biomarker may not be sufficient to make accurate disease diagnosis or prognosis. And so I think the challenge is, you know, how can we sort of put all of this information together and try to come up with our best um, sort of composite estimate of either, um, you know, identifying patients at, at high risk um, to, to progress. And so thank you for your attention. Jamie, thank you uh, so much for, for this presentation. Uh, it's important that we, we quantify and, and understand the data. We've had some some uh, very good questions uh, and uh, I'm going to go to those in a second because I need to start with this first one because I really appreciate all the work that, that Virginia in particular with the, doing the, the biomarker analysis and you have done uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the FNIH cohort and combining them. But if we think of all the rest of the discussions today, isn't it counterintuitive? Because you are selecting uh, one that is progressing because of A and B and C and lumping all commas into one box. Shouldn't we be looking at fewer combinations uh, of biomarkers so we have the endotype driven uh, progression rather than again lumping them into all boxes? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think... Um a question that statisticians love to ask is, um, what is the question? You know, what are we trying to do? And if in order to get your D mode approved, you need to show that it slows progression of x-ray based joint space width and that it alleviates symptoms, then the patient that you want to identify for your trial is somebody who is high, at, at high risk of those outcomes. Um, I think the question of, is that a relevant outcome to predict, or is it even reasonable to lump everybody together who is progressing by seven tenths of a millimeter of joint space width, some of whom are doing so because of meniscal extrusion, yeah. some of whom are doing so because of cartilage loss, some of whom are, you know, men who are six and a half feet tall where seven tenths of a millimeter isn't actually that much progression, you know, should we be lumping all of those people together, I think is, is, a, is a great question, um, but it's kind of a different question than what, who do you need to select into your DEMO trial to get your drug approved? And so I think that, that the question is, 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 what is the question? What are we trying to predict? Yeah, fair enough. I, I'm just worried that we are, we are not targeting patients. David Filson uh, has uh, written a, a straight to the point David Filson question here. So uh, how can you use post, -line, post baseline biomarker data in a trial when you select trial particip participants for randomization at baseline? I think that's an evil question. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And we've, <laughs> you know, sort of mold this over some, I mean, I think what's, what's interesting and we heard earlier about the, the approach study, which is, 
you know, utilizing data from an existing cohort and then sort of enrolling those subjects into the, the next phase of the trial. So, you know, I suppose if you had a setup like that where you were, you know, enrolling subjects into to the OAI or to a, a similar cohort study where you, you had that data available, and, you know, I wish I could remember, maybe somebody remembers, I, I think it was the ACR meeting a few years ago, there was a group that actually tried to do um, like an economic analysis that said, you know, how how good would we have to do in our enrichment strategy in order for it to make sense to sort of screen people at baseline and at 12 months? And I think they determined that that really wouldn't be feasible. You would have to have a pretty perfect um, algorithm to do that. So, yeah, I'm not sure that that looking at these short term changes to predict to predict longer term progression is really relevant in terms of an enrichment strategy. I just think unless we had really, really cheap biomarkers, it, it, that wouldn't work. But thinking about surrogate endpoints and, you know, could we instead of looking at joint space width over four years or over six years, could we look at um change in, in cartilage thickness in the central medial femur over 12 months or over 24 months. And so I think that was more of the rationale for including those um, short-term changes, predicting long-term progression. But, but I agree. I just, I don't think that financially it, it is really feasible to try to consider an enrichment strategy where you're measuring biomarkers over 24 months before you even randomize. David, do you want to? Um, to yeah, I'm, I'm to a little that? bit concerned. I number one, I think it, it, it's elegant in analytic and statistical work, Jamie. It, you should be congratulated. It's oh, lovely. thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm I'm nervous that assuming that all we have is baseline data before we randomize people in trials, which is what the relevant situation is, that the data you've shown, which is quite comprehensive, just doesn't generate a substantial enough uh, identification of those at progression to make it worth our while. And I'm, I'm wondering why we keep pursuing this question, to be honest with you. I, I realize that's a tough thing to say, but, but you're going to mess around with a lot of more sophisticated analytic techniques. And the great likelihood is that they're not going to crank up the AUC very much. Yeah. And, and I, I think we're going to be stuck with baseline predictors of systemic biomarkers for localized disease that just aren't very good. And I'm sort of wondering why we keep going down this road. I think this brings us back to the, the phenotype discussion, which um, Dr. Carsdale, you know, asked about, which we heard about earlier. And, and the, the question is, if we're, if we're pursuing this enrichment strategy, are we trying to you know, enrich for anybody who is um, losing seven tenths of a millimeter of joint space, or, or should we be thinking more about these phenotypes and trying to sort of cluster patients together based on, and, and we can do it, you know, in anything based on structure, based on, pay, there's been a lot of work that Tahina has done recently with pain phenotypes. Um, should we be trying to come up with more homogeneous subgroups before we we think about doing this enrichment. And I think that's some combination of those is something that we want to think about because I think I think that you're right that if if this truly is this heterogeneous disease where everybody is kind of progressing for different reasons, progressing on different pathways, are we ever going to come up with a strategy where we can predict that with high accuracy? And, and I don't think anything has yet. Thank you for, uh, for, for those answers. So we have a, another question here. And then after that, I'm, I'm going to loop back to, to David. Um, so uh, from uh, Amanda Addy, uh, great presentation. Aside from maintaining power. Oh, I think you're what... still muted. Oh, I hope not. Uh, can you hear what I'm saying? I can hear you, Morton. Oh, yeah. So, so hopefully you can hear me. So a, a, a presentation from Amanda, or a question from, from Amanda Ali. Great presentation. Aside from maintaining power, why not only use no progression as controls to maximize discrimination? Wouldn't including joint space with progression only or pain progression only among the controls dilute the effects? 
Yes, we've had a lot of debate about this. I think, again, trying to think maybe a little bit more pragmatically, um, if, if you're pursuing an enrichment strategy for a clinical trial, you don't get to only test people that are going to have composite progression or no progression. You know, you have to evaluate all comers. Um, and so I think sort of throwing out those people who only had joint space with progression or who only had pain progression, I mean, you couldn't sort of do that in a real world setting. Um, you, you'd have to evaluate everybody sort of who's, who's eligible. Um, and so, you know, I get that it, again, we've had, we've had lots of debates and arguments about this, that what does it mean to sort of predict composite joint space with and pain progression when you have people who are progressing in both of those in your control group? But at the end of the day, if we're talking about trying to do, um, you know, an enrichment strategy for a clinical trial to identify those people who are likely to progress on both, um, you, you have to compare them to everybody else. I think the, the question might be, maybe we should be looking at predicting people who have progression on any domain versus people who didn't progress at all versus looking at our sort of composite progressors versus everybody else. And maybe that would be sort of a better um, enrichment strategy. But I think, you know, that looking at no progression at all versus composite progression is, is not something that I think sort of lends itself to a, a, a real world um, a strategy. So I appreciate uh, those comments. So if, if, if um, um, going back to, to David, I, I, I think a professional disagree. Of course, we are able to measure something smart in a systemic fluid uh, to predict progressors. But I think there is, there is one uh, important point. It needs to be an overarching endotype. And actually, I think the UK Biobank paper showed that there is this low repair endotype, uh, or at least genes that are associated with repair mechanisms. So possibly we are able to find some of those uh, overarching uh, endotypes, not, not that are locally driven because of uh, an event, but simply because of, of genetic endotypes, overarching endotypes that result in low cartilage formation, uh, for example. So um, if I'm allowed to ask you a question, David, can, can you be a little bit more optimistic? You're muted. Yeah, I, I'm now not muted, Morton. Thanks for the question. I, I, you know, I guess the the proof is in the is in the data analysis. I, you know, I, I think you gotta you gotta <laughs> demonstrate it. it. It sounds very promising, but there's a lot of things historically now that have sounded very promising and that have turned out to be, you know, what Jamie showed, which and she did it elegantly, you know, which is they don't they don't predict much better than chance. Um, and uh, so I think I think the idea is very appealing, but we need to see some longitudinal data showing that if you characterize, if you measure that phenotype and characterize it well, that it will predict those things that you hope it'll predict. Yeah, I appreciate that. And this has been true, I mean, not just in this FNIH cohort, but um, I and, and others, probably some who are, who are at the meeting have looked at them. Um, trajectories of joint space loss, trajectories of cartilage loss, and then have attempted to predict those within the OAI, I think within the Czech cohort. And I mean, there's not really been anything that's had AUCs above 0 0.7, 0 0.75. So it's not just, you know, just this biomarkers consortium. It's, it's really been any effort to predict even just structural worsening. Um, so I think it just, it goes back to that that question that we're talking about today of phenotypes and, and should we be even lumping all of these people together? Because any way we've tried to analyze it, it, it hasn't, you know, we haven't had a high, high rate of success. I think we have some members of the Approach Consortium present actually. And I think uh, Irvin, you are a member of the Approach Consortium, isn't that right? And so, uh, so yeah, how, how is the Approach Consortium uh, dealing with this, uh, first of all, low AUC and combination of markers as compared to using more single markers? Uh, I think approach is more of um, 
uh, an academic uh, exercise, so to see if we are even able to find phenotypes, distinguish them, uh, more than to be able to translate them directly into very practical things like selecting subjects for a trial. As I also explained in my uh, presentation, I think the approach in approach <laughs> is so extensive that it's not practically feasible to do it in many other settings. Uh, so um, I think it will not be very easy to translate uh, any results from approach directly to a next trial, uh, but that it will be an achievement in itself if we are able to at least demonstrate that there are different phenotypes uh, at all. 